Hello all and welcome. Is uh, I'd like to begin actually by telling you a story. Oh, let me get my, there we go, by telling you a story. Uh, I started the, my company, Manager Mechanics, about, about eight and a half years ago. I guess time flies when you're having fun. And if you can picture this, you heard some things in my bio which will come forward, is I'm trying to start a company. I was nationally syndicated with Gatehouse Media. Uh, I was in about 250 newspapers a week. Uh, I also wrote for CIO.com. My column was called uh, Your IT Career. So uh, with starting a new company, it was a training company. I was developing materials. I was making pre uh, presentations to, cli to potential clients, et cetera. And I was on the hook every week for two 700-word publishable columns on different topics. So, uh, and for anyone out there who started a company, you know what it's like when you start it. A client says to you, hey, Eric, that sounds great. Can you send me a proposal? I hang up the phone. I'm all excited. And I think to myself, wow, I wonder what my proposal should look like. You know, then I do the job. They're happy with it. They say, great, send me an invoice. And it's my first invoice. And I think, huh, all right, what should my invoice look like? This was what happened eight and a half years ago, in addition to the columns, in addition to just a little bit of life in general, et cetera. So what I truly looked like was this picture. That was my desk. Now, it all came to a head on one Sunday evening. And what happened to me was, is that uh, now this was maybe two years into writing my column for Gatehouse Media. It was due to my publisher on Monday sometime, and then it was published that coming Friday. But my worst nightmare from a writer's perspective was that it would be a Sunday night, I wouldn't know what my topic was, and I was really too tired to write it but had to get it done. This was that Sunday night. In two years prior to this and in the two years after that I was nationally syndicated, never happened to me again. But it was a very, very busy week at work. During the weekend, I had various family commitments, and poof, it's 9 o'clock on Sunday night. So what I did was what I always do. You know, I said, all right, you know, I uh, had a couple of cups of coffee. Now, keep in mind, I'm a morning person. Had a couple of cups of coffee, you know, sort of, uh, you know, kept uh, hitting myself in the cheeks a little bit. Come on, wake up, wake up. Uh, and then I started writing. <clears throat> About two o'clock in the morning, three cups of coffee later, two or three uh, versions of it uh, behind me. I'm done. That said, thank God. Two o'clock in the morning, went to bed. Of course, I had three cups of coffee about nine o'clock. So guess what? I laid bug-eyed in bed until about five o'clock, got about three hours sleep, woke up in the morning and said, oh, great. My column is all ready to send out. Well, guess what? This is literally that column. And I only showed you this top part of it because there was more red on it from there down and wanted to share myself that embarrassment. In effect, what I'd written the night before wasn't quite up to the standards of being nationally syndicated. It was probably be best described that it would be best used to line the bottom of a birdcage. And I said to myself, I said, you know what? I'm never going to do this to myself again. I just didn't have the energy to do it. What I should have done instead of plowing ahead, it was nine o'clock at night. I was exhausted. Um, I should have just maybe hung around, you know, watched a little bit of TV till maybe 930, maybe 10 o'clock, just hanging around go to bed, wake up early, and write my column. Because <clears throat> what happened to me that Monday morning was not only was I up late, not only didn't I sleep well, but, I, but the column that I'd written looked like this. I basically had to rewrite it from scratch. So I made a decision to myself that and I said, you know what, is that if I'm not up to doing a task, if I don't have the energy to do it, if I'm not mentally alert enough to perform that task, I mean, there's always emergencies that come up, you know, I mean, if you have to do something, you do what you have to do. But sort of given the planning or given the nature of it, there was no reason why I couldn't have written it the following morning. And you know what? I should have. So the problem was I wasn't in the zone. I wasn't in a good position to be able to write. So let's talk about the zone for a moment. First thing you need to be is you need to be mentally clear. In other words, you have to know exactly what it is that you want to do. You know, I knew exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to get that column written so I could get to bed. But that's the first part of things that you need to sort of be in the zone. And then we'll talk a little bit about the zone in a moment. The next thing is, is you have to be highly focused, single-minded. You have to, you know, get the distractions out and you really need to be concentrating on exactly what you're doing. Was I single-minded? Sure I was. Were there any distractions? 
No way. It was midnight and one in the morning on a Sunday night. So I'm two for two so far. The next one, mentally able. In other words, which I was not, obviously, on that Sunday evening. But what happens is, is to be in the zone, you have to be mentally able and mentally ready to go. You have to have the, abil the, the mental ability. I don't mean you're smart or you're not smart or you're, you know, you're strong or you're not strong. I mean, given like myself, is that that night I did not have the mental ability to write that, the, the physical ability to write that article. I was exhausted after a long weekend and a tough week of work. And then the fourth one is you have to be motivated. Was I motivated? Yeah, I was. Uh, but the truth is, is, uh, you know, three out of four, it isn't going to do it for you. Now, when I'm talking about being in the zone is that, you, you know, uh, you may have experienced it from a number of perspectives. Cleaning your garage. Let's get out of the technical and the business stuff for a minute. Have you ever done that? You look at the garage, it's a Saturday morning, and you say, uh, oh, yeah, you know, I'll just clean a little bit. You know, for weeks I've been saying to myself that I'm going to clean the garage. It's spring. So then I say, all right, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take this, clear off the floor a little bit, maybe sweep the floor. And then I really get into it. And then I start, I've sweeped the floor. You know what? I'm going to clean my workbench. All right, the workbench is looking great. You know what? The, um, the, uh, the shelving that we have on the side that we use for storage. I bet there's a lot of stuff in there we don't need anymore. Why don't I get that ready and bring it to Savers or to donate to somewhere else and clean that up? Maybe I can get a couple of, uh, a couple of shelves empty for other things. And I'm just totally into this. Have you ever been in that kind of mode? That's what being in the zone is. Now, it can be from work. It could be from other things. But if you can just sort of get that concept in your head. Now, what I've done is uh, I actually spoke to some athletes, and uh, I said, you know, well, what do you think of the zone, this idea of it? And what they've said to me is that their best games where they, you know, they had perfect mind-body synchronization, where everyone else seemed to be moving a little bit slower, where they knew mentally just where to be, and that when they were in the zone, that was the best games of their profession. I also talked to some musicians, and a jazz musician in particular, who said to me, he says he liked to do a lot of improvising. And he says when he's really in the zone, it's funny, he sort of is the instrument. The music just comes out of him. And, you know, his best gigs, you know, his best uh, improvs came when he was really just totally in encapsulated in the music. For me personally, it's when I'm writing a column, working on a presentation. In fact, this presentation, which um, many of the beginnings of it, actually many of the pieces of it since modified, were originally built when I was in the zone to do my TED Talk. But anyway, beyond that is, is that I'm a computer programmer by, ba uh, by background. I started uh, my career as a, well as a programmer, uh, moved up, to, up through the ranks. Um, but with that is that I found when I was programming, <laughs> is that I would get in the zone and I would know exactly the algorithm that I wanted to build, the, the way I wanted to connect it to the databases, everything along those lines. So that's what being in the zone is. Now, I'll speak from personal experience in here and say, that's all great, but you know what? I don't know about you. I can't always be in the zone. I'd like to be, but you know, I get tired, you know, I'm just not in the mood. Um, you know, I've had a, a, a busy day and it's 3.30 in the afternoon and there's one more thing that I want to write and I just can't do it. What I found with myself and just in, in speaking with others, you can't always be truly at that top of your game. So if that's the case, what do you do? <clears throat> I believe that people have four zones. Listed here. Now, the way for you to remember this is, as you notice, they spell the word task. T is top of your game. And I'm just going to describe it at a high level, and then I'm going to give you a slide on each here. But top of your game, that's when you're in the zone. That's when you're here, you know, that we were talking about, when all of these things are in place. You know, when you're just, well, as it says here, you're mentally clear, you're highly focused, you're physically able, which I wasn't on that Sunday night, and you're really motivated. You're really getting into it. <clears throat> the next is, is you're alert 
but you're not creative. Like if you've ever been really awake and really working on something and you're trying to say, write a proposal for a client or start a presentation or write a blog or whatever else it might be, and you just can't get that first sentence down, you just don't have that uh, creative gene kicked in, that's what alert and uh, alert but not creative is. <clears throat> Your next is sluggish. What sluggish is, is just imagine that you had a, uh, a nice big pasta lunch and it's 1.30 and it, you're back at your office and you're trying to get some work done. And, you know, maybe uh, you, you couldn't help yourself. The, uh, the Chianti was on sale, you know, for $4 a glass. You said, oh, why not? You'd have one. And then 1.30, you realize you have to be working on something important. Very hard to do. Sluggish could also be is based on your natural um, circadian rhythms. So in other words, uh, I'm a morning person. I'm much better in the morning than I am late at night. Well, obviously, as said from my story before, but I'm, uh, I, I find myself, I have a lull, not at 1 o'clock, interestingly, but like from 2 to 3 in the afternoon, it's a time where I would consider myself sluggish. Now, if I have to be up, I can do it, but it's not my natural time of day. Keeping awake is when, you know, I mean, if you weren't at the office, you would be lying down, putting up your feet, and watching TV. Or you would be doing something, you know, other that, that, that does not require much physical or mental activity. So these are what the four zones are. Now, for me personally, what I do, and it doesn't really matter what I do, is that use me as an example. Look at the things that I do in these zones and just compare them to yourself of what you would do. Because at the end of the day, this webinar has nothing to do with me. It's, how, it, it's about you and how you can implement this concept should you find it of value. So for me, when I'm at the top of my game, that's when I will, will write my blogs, books, etc. Uh, I'll also create presentations. As I mentioned, this one was initially written when I was at the top of my game. Or in, I'll answer important client queries. Not the what time is the meeting, but uh, um, could you please provide us uh, a proposal on how to do X? And I'm really excited about whatever X is that I'll be doing for that client. So as a result, I want to make sure when I'm at the top of my game. Why? Because we're in the, when we're at the top of our game, we can do our best work. Alert, but not creative. I just love that picture because something about a cup of coffee, I'm usually smiling at the cup. I'm glad when it smiles back at me. But anyway, what I'll do at uh, alert, but not creative, is I'll do emails. You know, not the one that I mentioned in the last slide where I really need to get everything right because it's, you know, a proposal, a new client is, you know, hanging in the balance. But this would be your, your standard business emails where you have to do, you know, very appropriate, very business-like and so on correspondence, but it's not highly creative. I would do status reports, which is for the most part a collection and analysis of what's done. I'll do client invoices, or maybe just maybe I'll just do something that I know is creative that I need to do in the top of my game. I'll just try a little of it and see maybe I can get into it through the mental focus and raise my game into being uh, being at the T, top of my game. We'll come back to that one, though. Now, if I'm sluggish, which means I'm really not up to mental, uh, up to mental challenge, that's a really good time for me to maybe do my expense report or to, to check my spam folder. You know, just going through it, looking for things that may be of value. You know, there's not a lot of brain power that goes on. You just have to look through and say, oh, yeah, this one I should read later, this one I should read later, et cetera. Uh, or it's a good time for me to uh, find presentation graphics to include into my presentations. Why? Because I can sit back there, you say, on the sofa with my feet up or whatnot and say, oh, yeah, that's a little, that's a pretty picture. That sort of uh, ties to the slide that I'm doing. Uh, interestingly enough is that I found, I found the graphic that I'm using in Sluggish when I was Sluggish. But these are things that I find that found that I could do effectively when I was with low energy. Now, if I was with really low energy, the K, which was keeping awake, the first thing I learned to do, and by the way, I'm just going to pause here because I don't know about you, I'm a dog person, so I just love this picture. Okay, back to the webinar. Uh, is that for me, if I am at keeping awake, what I'll do is I'll shut my computer. Now, keep in mind, I'm a techie by background, but I know myself is that if I'm like really tired and can't really concentrate well, you know, I'll mouse click to the left instead of mouse clicking to the right, and poof, I've moved a folder that will take me three hours to find. 
So I've just learned that about myself. Trust me, that's the voice of experience, at least for me, is that if I'm really, you know, uh, losing it in that way and just too tired, I just shut my computer. So I'll do other things, you know, I'll clean my office, things along that line, you know, things that I can do with really, you know, that are more rote in nature rather than being, uh, you know, heavy physical or mental activity. Now, that's basically what the four steps of task, uh, of, uh, of task is. What I'd like to do now is begin talking about other ways to apply it. Because again, as I've said earlier, it doesn't matter what this means for me. It matters what this means for you. So here's your big takeaway. The takeaway here is basically what you want to do is you can maximize your productivity by selecting tasks that match your current level of energy. <clears throat> so what I mean by that in effect is do things backwards. Is what I want you to do is I want you to sit back and say, what's your level of energy at this moment? Are you at a high level of energy? Are you at a low level of energy? So sort of how do you feel? A little bit of what do you feel like doing, but it's more is what's your current level of ability? And then based on that, whether you think you're at a T, an A, an S, or a K, is then select the task that in fact needs exactly that level of energy. The reason is, is because if you're really dull, in a really dull moment, is it's a good time to check your spam folder or whatever it might be. But now, if you don't follow this rule, if you say, well, you know what, I'm just going to do, regardless of my level of energy, I'm just going to do what I want to do because I got to get it done, um, is that what will happen to you is that if you're at a low energy time. Excuse me, Eric, I'm just going to jump in for a second. Absolutely. Mind. I see that we have a couple raised hands, and I do just want to quickly mention that um, we will be having a Q&A session. Um, so if you do have specific questions for Eric, we are actually going to leave that towards the end. There should be a Q&A box at the bottom. So feel free to actually just drop your questions in then. And um, I understand that he's willing to stay on the line for as long as there are questions. Um, but if you are having problems like um, audio or something like that, feel free to indicate that in the Q&A box as well. Um, I want to make sure that um, I, can, I can get to that as soon as possible or see how I can help you. Um, but I do just want to note to everyone, if you have questions, feel free to pop it in the Q&A and we will address them at the end. Thank you so much. Go ahead, Eric. Okay. Mo, my pleasure. Thank you for bringing that in. So where I was just to sort of back up to give the, uh, the basically the concept said here was that you want to figure out what your level of energy is, thus the cute kid on the left. And then once you decide your level of energy, pick something to work on that matches that level of energy best you can, thus the cute kid on the right. Now, if you don't do this, what will happen is, is that if you're at a low energy time, and you try to perform a high energy task. You know, the obvious description or example of this would be me on that Sunday night. I didn't follow this rule. But, you know, another thing could be, and what I found that way, but you, what you may have also experienced also, if you're trying to do a high energy task when you're at low personal energy, the task will take twice as long, and it'll only be of half the quality which means then you're probably gonna to have to go back and redo it, which will take more time, et cetera. So this time management technique, just from these couple of slides, this concept alone, what it can do is it can dramatically increase your productivity. Why? Because if you, it, it will take you less time if you do things at a higher zone, um, but will also considerably increase your quality. But now let's go the other direction. What happens is if I'm in a very high personal energy. In other words, it's first thing on a Tuesday morning, just came in, had a cup of coffee for breakfast, had a good night's sleep, I'm ready to roll. And what I do is, is that I then immediately say, you know what, I haven't checked my spam folder for a while. So I go in and I analyze my spam folder. Now, will I do a great job of analyzing my spam folder? Absolutely I will. But the problem with that is, is that I'm squandering a high energy time working on a low energy task. And at the end of the day, or what that may cause me to do, is then have to do a high energy task 
when it, I'm winding down for the day and I'm not quite as mentally alert as I was in the morning. So just by I, naturally what I would want to do would be to swap the orders of those. Now, when I talk about this concept with clients, with, with others, and so on, I'm asked some commonly asked questions, which what I'd like to do here is basically relay to you those questions, some of which actually came through this type of question box. And by the way, by answering some here, by asking the question and answering myself, I'm by no means minimizing the want to have your questions at the end, as Bella had said. The first question I'm asked is, how do you know what zone you're in? Okay, let me tell you how I used to do it, and then I'll tell you how, uh, you know, the one to four that's listed here. What I used to do is, is that what my wife refers to is I did the guy thing. Is I, I had something I wanted to do that was a top of my game activity, say writing a blog. And I'd be sort of tired, but I'd say, ah, no problem, I can do this. You know, and then I'd get started on it, and, you know, it wouldn't work. So then I'd basically spin my wheels a little bit, and then eventually would have to move to another task. But the way to, that I suggest you to do it here, you know, from a process perspective, is first what you need to do, which I did not do on that Sunday night, was I need to listen, you need to listen to your body and listen to your mind. And basically just be honest to yourself and say, hey, you know what? At this given moment, what am I up to doing? Now, uh, after that, what you do is you say, okay, I'm up to, say, alert but not creative. So that I'll look, on my, uh, I'll look through my list of activities that I want to perform, and I'll look for something that matches that. Now, what you'll see later in this is that I'm going to suggest putting a TAS or K, you know, before, uh, you know, to, to work out your, uh, your activity lists in those orders. But we'll, we'll get to that soon. But for now, just know, find an activity that matches your current level of energy. From there, work on it for four or five minutes, and then just do a sort of a mental check and say, did I pick the right thing? So let's say I said, yes, I'm, a, uh, I'm at the top of my game, and I start writing that blog, and I can't get the first sentence to come out right. Probably I should say to myself, you know what? Maybe now isn't the right time. Maybe it's time to go do something that is a uh, um, alert but not creative task. So I'll step it down a little. Um, and then from there, if needed, I'll adjust it. This is part four. Or if I'm saying, yeah, I'm, I'm in a good flow here, I'll just continue on. Now, let me say one other thing on this also. Is, so let's say that I start a task, top of my game. You know, I begin to write that blog. I get three sentences, three sentences written, and the phone rings. I pick it up, and it's some type of work emergency. The, uh, the email system is down. Uh, a client is called and is all upset. You know, some of the, the, the business things that continually get, you know, get in our way, the, the firefighting, so to speak, of the management and business world. So what I do is, is that I take that call, I call three people into my office, we figure out what's going on, we delegate the tasks, about 45 minutes go by, I come back into my office, because you know, when the emergencies come, by definition they're emergency, bang, you work with them right then. So then I come back, I was at the top of my game when the phone call came in, I'm now sitting, uh, sitting at my desk waiting to write sent uh, sentence number four in my blog, and I say to myself, I say, you know what, 40 minutes ago when the phone rang, I was at the top of my game. But you know what? Boy, that just sort of sucked the life out of me. I, I need to recoup. So maybe I'm not at the top of my game anymore. Maybe I'm sluggish. So maybe I'll grab a cup of coffee. Maybe I'll go for a walk a little bit. Uh, maybe I'll do something that's at a lower level and then go back to my blog at a later time when I'm back at the top of my game. Next is, can you purposely raise your zone? Well, I will give you a very definitive, sometimes yes, sometimes no. And I truly mean that wholeheartedly. I'll give you an example of both. If uh, you've had a long day at work, so uh, uh, or let me say, I'll pick that Sunday, I'm, pick that Sunday night for me. It was a long weekend, it was Sunday night, I'm a morning person, it's nighttime, I had a really tough week at work the previous week, you know, just all good things, but very busy things, very mentally tasking. I uh, had some things running around, all, again, all fun things and good things with family, but Sunday night, I didn't have many brain cells that were working, you know, in the same direction. So then, could I raise my zone? Probably not. And actually, it proof showed that I couldn't or didn't.
Now, God forbid it was a major emergency in life. You know, the adrenaline goes, you probably can kick it up. But for the most part, no, that can't happen, at least for me. Now, let's say that it was that example I used earlier, had a pasta lunch, a um, little bit of Chianti. I come back to my office. It's 1.30. I decide I want to write my blog because I have to get it done. Or there was something, my boss came into my office and said, hey, we really need this by 3 o'clock. And I'm thinking, oh, great. I just had a pasta lunch and Chianti. Can I raise my zone then? I would say then the answer is yes. Because what do you do? You have a cup of coffee. Maybe you take a walk around the building, get a little bit of fresh air. You, um, you just wait a little while for digestion to happen, so to speak. And then you're off to the races. So what I would say is, is again, know your body, know your mind. There will be times when you can, and there'll be times when you can't raise your zone. Now, if you try to raise your zone, what are different ways that you can do it? One of which is mental activity. So in other words, get up. A lot of people I know go to the gym lunchtime and people say, oh, but you're, you're gone like an hour and 20 minutes. By the time you get there, you work out, you shower, you get back. And what they say is, yeah, but you know what? For the whole afternoon, I have twice the productivity than if I don't go to the gym. And they say that they totally make that time back because they're of higher energy because of the physical activity. Maybe it just means walking around the building. Uh, maybe it means that I'll tell you one thing that's worked well for me is I recently, maybe six months ago, got one of those desk, uh, desks that can stand up and go down. I can't think of the name of the vendor, um, but oh, I can look at it right here. Um, er Ergotron, that basically it sits on my desk so I can work standing up or sitting down. And I find that that works really well, is that if uh, that I'll basically work standing up for a while, not only is, uh, is you know, what do they say is that sitting is the new smoking, but um, it, will, it will help raise my energy. I actually have a friend that what he did was he took an old treadmill that he had at home and he duct taped his old laptop to the top of it. Why? Because then he could put the, put it on very, the treadmill on very, very slowly, not running on it, but just in a very, very slow, almost a saunter. And then he would be answering emails. And that physical activity was a value to him. I said that actually in a, in a live keynote. And someone uh, basically said, you, you can actually buy, uh, buy treadmills now that you can actually physically put on a laptop or an iPad for that very reason. I mean, you could watch a movie, but you could also use it for that. The other is is uh, um, talking with someone with, with high energy people. I'm going to give you an example of this, and you'll you'll see this actually in not real life, but in a better example later on. Is that you know I'm sort of sluggish, and boy, I got a lot of work to do. And say this was last week, and you know what? I need to talk to Bella, the one that was on at the beginning, about how about things for the logistics and such for today's webinar. So what I do is that uh, I say, you know what, I really need to get some extra energy. You know, I really got to get the blood flowing, so to speak. So what I'll do is I had a, on my, uh, you know, on my list of activities for the day to call Bella. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll call her, I get her on the phone. And then the combination, because she's, uh, she's high energy, it's an important topic for us and so on, is that over the course of that conversation, I'll actually be able to feed on the energy of both the topic and the, discuss and the discussion you know, of Bella's energy and enthusiasm. So then when I hang up the phone with her, is that I may have raised my zone from sluggish, bang, all the way to, uh, to top of my game. So that one works. And as we all know, the third one, caffeine works, is that uh, also, I don't, I've never, I've never actually had one, but people say that the, uh, the what, what is it, the five hour, uh, five, the, the, the five, that little five hour drink that you, that you can have. Uh, I don't know if you can tell, I'm a little type A to begin with. I'd be bouncing off the walls, I think, if I had one of those. Uh, but, you know, caffeine, so to speak. Well, lastly, mental focus. Do you remember in one of the earliest slides when I was talking about what I did when I was in A, alert but not creative, was is that maybe, just maybe, I would try a task that was a top of my game task and then maybe through additional mental focus, I would move toward it. So, um, so move toward top of my game. So, you know, I just try it a little bit. I try an easier part of a bigger project. And then I get into it. And then I get into it a little bit more. And then I really get rolling. And before I know, I'm in this high zone, uh, th this high zone of productivity truly at the top of my game. And it's that mental focus that allowed me to do that. 
Now, what I'd like all of you to do is I'd like to, I'll be quiet for a moment, and that I'd like you to just, as it says here, write down five or six items that you are planning to do today. It could have even been a couple you've already done or some other things you'd like to do. But just, uh, you know, either on, um, you know, uh, just on a pencil and paper or just mentally, but better if you do it physically, type it in or, or write it down. Just five or six things that you're planning on doing. And then what I'd like you to do is I'd like you to put a T, an A, an S, or a K before each of those five or six items based obviously on how much energy you assume it will take to get that task done. What I'll do is, is I'll just be quiet for a moment. I, I would sing you the, the Jeopardy song uh, but yeah, that, that they do when they do the final question, but I really don't want that on tape, and you wouldn't either if you've ever heard me sing. So I'm just continuing to wait a sec for you while you write down that short list of activities. I'll give you another sec. Just keep talking quietly while, so quite frankly, so that you'll know I'm still here. Okay, now there were two reasons why I asked you to do that, to actually write out a few items and put the letter T, A, S, or K before it. <clears throat> the first of which is now, is you have no excuse not to try this, is when you go to do one of those items, just try to do it at one of those times that you said that it would be a T, A, S, or K. Now what you'll find is it takes a little practice, both for you to uh, be able to correctly assess the level that you're at and the level of your activities, but it, it's a pretty fast learning curve to do it. The second reason is, is that I've used a technique on you called consistency. It's actually, just as a quick aside for a moment, uh, consistency is one of the six rules of influence based on Caldini's book on, in fact, he does a great webinar on it called The Art and Science of Persuasion. The mere fact that you've done this once is consistent with you then trying it once and then for you to continue do it, doing it moving forward. So what I'd like to do now, you having done that, is just ask, uh, you know, ask yourself, do you have any questions regarding these four steps before, uh, regarding these four levels before we move forward? If so, I'd like to ask you to take a second. Uh, while you're thinking of them, type them into the, uh, into the question box. And everybody stay. We have more to do. I just wanted to give you a moment before I segwayed on you. Okay, good. So those of you who are typing, please feel free to continue to. And now what I'd like to do is that uh, I'd like to begin to talk about how task can be used, obviously, which was the topic of today's, of, of the title of today's webinar, is how it can be used really effectively with the priority matrix. To do that, though, just in case there's some that's not familiar, just want to describe it for just a, a second or two. The prim priority matrix, it's actually a leading, uh, a leading priority management software application designed to help managers become more effective. It's featured in the Apple Store as the top, one of the top getting things done app in virtually every country in the world. The priority matrix system is used by thousands of organizations worldwide uh, uh, to improve their team communication, increased accountability, and to help people just get things, uh, get the right things done. What I'm really excited also to say is that because of its, it's very adaptable in its nature by the way it was designed, that it really works well with my task methodology as previously explained. So with that, I would like to use that as a segue to now talk about, okay, you know, I've talked about this task, about task and what it is and so on, is that now let's come up with a couple of examples of how it can be used within the priority matrix. 
So here's the first. What I, what I did here was, and by the way, is, is I've used these four names. One thing, not that I should be talking too much on the product, but one thing I love about the product is you can create the four box with whatever stuff you need in it that meets, that meets your needs. For me and my needs is that I built it to look like this. Now let me say this isn't a screenshot of it, but it looks just like this. What I did for presentation purposes was I recreated it so I could make the fonts bigger, you know, to show well uh, when being displayed. But anyway, what I've done is now you see is that I have top of my game, et cetera, and some things that, I, that may be my, uh, my current activities that I want to provide in the, next, in the next day or so. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring you through a scenario. Is, and by the way, to see where I am with this, you'll see a little movement in the text on the slides for the items I'm talking about. So I come back from lunch. It's that, uh, that I, I love Italian food. You know, it's the pasta lunch that I'd mentioned. So I get back to my desk. I want to at least be a little bit productive, but I'm feeling sluggish. So feeling sluggish, the first thing that I decide to do is I decide to go through my spam folder. You know, I've gone through that, you know, and then I'm going, I'm looking at it. There were a couple of things that, uh, uh, that I really had to pay attention to, like, wow, I can't that believe that went in there. Oh, my God, it came from a client three days ago. What am I going to do? It woke me up a little bit. So from there, what I'm going to do is that uh, basically is I'm going to do next, which is I'm going to call Bella. The reason is, as that mentioned before, is, you know, I'm getting there, I'm feeling a little bit better, but you'll see that Bella is an alert but not creative because we were going to talk about the logistics related for today's webinar, not figure out what the webinar should be. So I get off the phone with, uh, with Bella, who's high energy, who was an important topic for us. I'm excited about the webinar. So now if you look in the top left, now I'm top of my game. So what do I do? I go ahead and I write my blog and, um, whoops, I write my blog and then I'm ready to roll for the rest of the day. So here's an example of just by bouncing around that, uh, that this will work for me in that regard. Now, um, now let me tie it to the standard metrics, the uh, matrix that's used. Now, in this case, the do now planned low priority and unca uh, uncategorized is obviously coming from a standard feature within priority metric matrix. Now, I got to tell you something funny. First, you'll see that the letter T, A, S, or K is before each one of the, uh, the letters. Now, the reason that I started doing that was because when I, when I first started using this myself, what I said was, you know what, I could just look over my task. I don't need to write down these letters. You know, I know my tasks. I know what I want to do. I could just say, all right, I'm feeling sluggish. What's a sluggish task for me to perform? But what happened was, I, this, this is a true story, actually. I got myself caught in a catch-22. I was sluggish, which means what? I'm not at the top of my game mentally. I should be doing things that are not particularly mentally taxing. So I was sluggish, maybe sluggish on the cusp of keeping awake. I was looking at my to-do list, and because I was so sluggish, I couldn't really evaluate what was a sluggish activity to do. So I just basically sat there and did nothing. So, I, you know, I laughed a little bit about it at the time. And then when I was more up to it, I said, hey, you know what? I want to do something that's much more rote than that. So, uh, you know, I'll basically put the T or the A or whatever, the S and K, before the activity. So when I'm sluggish or keeping awake, when I really can't figure out what to do, it becomes very much a rote activity for me to just look at the letter and move forward. So now, let me, in this format, let me show you uh, or go through an example for you of how we could do this. So first, what happens is, is it's a Monday morning. I was on a friend's boat on Sunday. I got home late. So let's say I, I am a morning person. I mentioned that, but let's just say I'm not a morning person. So Monday mornings aren't great for me anyway. So I come in and I'm really feeling basically keeping awake. But I'm looking at here and saying, what should I work on? Because I mean, there are things I should do now. There are planned priorities, et cetera. But, but let me, so let me look at the do now and oh good, there's a K there. So what I do is that uh, I decide to mail my bills. They were personal bills. I had them in the brief, my briefcase over the weekend. I forgot to mail them on the way to the office because I was so exhausted. So I say, gee, you know what? The mail room's on the other side of the building. I'll get the blood flowing a little bit, give me a little bit of exercise, you know, get me going for the morning. 
So then, you know, I get back to my office and said, well, you know, it's still Monday morning. So I then say, all right, I don't have any other Ks under do now. So I look down and, ooh, look what I find. I have to finalize my lunch plans. So what that is, is that's a quick email or a phone call to whoever I was planning to have lunch with. You know, you can really almost do that on autopilot without an awful lot of work. So I get that done. I'm a little bit better, but I'm still not feeling great. So I said, oh, you know what? Yeah, I got to print that budget report, you know, for, uh, for a meeting later today, this one here. So what I do is I print the budget report. And then I had to get up from my office. I had to go to another part of the building, you know, down the hall, so to speak, to the printer. I take it off. I come back to my office. Then, you know what? I'm feeling a little bit better. So then I go looking through my list and say, oh, you know what, maybe um, I've moved from, uh, uh, from keeping awake up to sluggish. And saying, but I, but uh, oh, look what I got there uh, to call my car dealer. Uh, so what I do is, is that uh, I call my car dealer who is very, very type A, uh, who is telling me that, uh, you know, I need a new front end alignment and I and two of my tires aren't any good. And it's a lot more money than I thought it was going to be. And then I get transferred over to the service people. And then they tell me that there's a part that's not in stock and blah, blah, blah. So anyway, after all that, guess what is, you know, I'm get off the phone with this guy. I'm off to the races. So then I go back to look at my list. You know, and now what do I do is I look up at the top and say, gee, I'm really feeling, feeling like I'm at the top of my game. So what I do is, is that, uh, you know, I make that phone call. I, co I call the client. I close the deal. You know, I'm feeling really good about that. And in addition to that, what happened was, is, you know, not only was I high energy on this and I was excited. And when the client said, yeah, you know what, let's do this. Now, what that could be is that could be calling my, uh, you know, instead of a client, it could be calling my boss and saying, hey, I'd really like to do this. Can I have more budget? And giving my 30 second pitch. Uh, if I'm a project manager, it could be talking to one of my stakeholders about moving forward on something or talking to, talking to say, someone in the P. PMO, the project management office, on saying, gee, there's a great project out there on big data I'd love to do. Will you let me do it? Whatever that important phone call is for you. And then I'm rolling off that. You know, I have the adrenaline going. I'm excited. So then I look again on the do now. Uh, and what do I have there? Oh, look at that, to write a presentation. So I say, okay, you know, the next thing is, is that I'll do the presentation. Now, you know, that's really where my example ends here. But what I could say, is I could say, hey, you know what? Um, let's say that uh, after doing the presentation, you know, I'm now, you know, that was writing a presentation, being on the phone with a couple of people, you know, it's, uh, it, it, my activity is winding down a little bit, is that uh, obviously this is a small example with just a few items. Then I might say, gee, you know what? Uh, I need a little bit of a breather. So what do I have on there that's an S or a K? And if I don't have any of those, then, you know, maybe I'll say, all right, what's, uh, you know, all alert, but uh, alert, but not creatives on created equal. Yeah, maybe it planned. Uh, yeah, I'll just write my status report. That won't be too mentally tasked, uh, um, task, uh, too mentally taxing because I'm expecting that will be easy to do. I already have the core components written. So anyway, from here, what I'd like to do next um, is I'd like to open it up to questions. I'd like to bring uh, uh, Bella back on. Uh, I've put the task, if you remember, that was from an earlier slide today, uh, just to give you an idea if you hadn't had a chance to write down the items or whatnot. Um, so uh, Bella, what uh, I, know, I believe you have some questions for me? Hi, Eric. Yes, we have a couple great questions. Um, I'm going to start with this one. And it's actually um, from someone who likes to use the item tags. Um, so they were asking if you think there's a special um, a cognitive benefit to having the T right in front of the name of the task in the matrix, or um, would it be sort of equally beneficial if they used it in the, if they use the tags? Um, you know, the, the short answer to that, I would say, is that whatever works best for you. You know, one thing that I, I like about priority matrix, quite frankly, is it's very flexible. You could do either one. Uh, so whatever you, if you love the tags, then I would say use the tags. Uh, you know, if you don't really want them or you're newer with the system and you're still figuring out how the tags work or whatnot, uh, put a T, you know, the, put the letters before it. So I would say is as the flexibility to do both, there's no right or wrong. The only right is whatever works best for you to implement this process. 
Awesome. And then we have a couple more as well. Um, we have one attendee asking, what do you do when you're in a long-term slump or lengthy season of depression? How do you find fresh energy? Wow. Um, what, what I would say to that, it's really interesting. And I'm going to tie to a friend of mine who actually just unrelated to, to this said this to me. He says, when you're really, um, when you're really engaged with something, it brings action. When you're really sort of in a personal slump, just getting out and doing the action builds engagement. So what I would say is, is that, uh, you know, obviously for lots of reasons, we can just do the best we can. But what you may want to do is start on a task. If you can find those kind of tasks that have sort of low, medium, and high, like there's two, two activities in it that can be done with low energy, and then there's two or three activities in it, you know, sort of continuing on the process to finish the task that maybe are alert, not creative, and then there's a creative portion of it. Try to just get mentally focused on say something that would, would be considered a sluggish type task. And hopefully if you can get into it, the mental focus of it would be to, to try to use that to help you move forward. I mean, this is a very simplistic answer to uh, you know, a very you know, potentially difficult and complicated question, but you know, barring other, uh, you know, other items that, that that could potentially help. Awesome. Um, and then I think you might have actually answered this, um, but I just want to ask you this again to make sure that this attendee had their questions answered. Um, they're asking, do you have more examples of sluggish or keeping awake tasks? Um, Ooh. Um, yeah, uh, keeping awake tasks, again, it's anything off the computer. What I do a lot, uh, all right, I'll, get, uh, I'll just tell you a couple, is, is that if I'm at, uh, if I'm at keeping awake, um, I'm pretty done. What I will try to do is is that I will, you know, if if, if I'm at, if I'm at ho working at home that day, you know, I'll just take a nap or I'll put on put on the television uh, with the hope of that. What what I've learned over time is actually relaxing for a few minutes and recharging your batteries. You might say, oh yeah, I didn't do anything from 1:30 to 2 working at home today. But if you use that time to just you know relax, uh, you know, watch. 30 minute, uh, you know, rerun on Discovery Channel and then get back in it. That's when I'll do it at K. Uh, or I might like run out to the grocery store kind of thing. Sluggish, what I'll do is when I'm in a sluggish mode, there's that, that's when I try to gain a lot of my educational material. Not only do I uh, not only do I teach all of this kind of stuff on leadership and uh, interpersonal communication and, and business skills, but I'm also a student of it. So what I do is I keep a whole list of uh, YouTube videos that I see, or uh, I'm, very, I'm a big believer in Coursera, you know, the massive online open courses. For everyone who's never used it, it's the word course with an RA at the end. So coursera.org. There's another one, which is edx.org, spelled obviously E-D-X. And what they are is these are the free online courses by the universities so if I'm in a sluggish mood where I really can't get much of my own work done rather than put on a sitcom or, or you know do something that's of marginal value is I'll sit there and I'll watch it like a TV show you know take notes and try to ingest as much as I can those are the, the, the biggest ones that I, I do under the sluggish other than you know cleaning my office and, and things along that line. Thank you. And then we actually have one question, actually two questions, I should say, um, that I'm going to combine. One of our attendees is asking you, how do you accommodate for deadlines? And then another is asking um, to, if you could sort of reiterate a little bit what you were talking about emergencies. How do you, how do you deal with emergencies? Okay. Let me start with the emergencies one. And with emergencies, you know, as the, as the expression goes, humans make plans and God laughs is that I could say, okay, right now I am at the top of my game and I am going to write a blog. But then a phone call comes in or whatever it is. You know, it, in, as, as managers, is that a big part of our job is fighting fires, getting a call from a client or a senior manager, or if you're in technology, the system goes down. It, at that point, to a certain extent, everything here goes out the window and you do what you got to do. 
So is that, so I would take it from that perspective is that, but then when you come back to your desk is use this opportunistically. I think in the example I said, I was at the top of my game and then I got a phone call and then I was exhausted after fighting whatever fire it was for 40 minutes, got back to my desk and poof, I'm sluggish. So each time you go to start a task, sort of with em fitting emergencies in wherever they have to be done. Now, during that emergency, you know, if you're at sluggish and you, out, you, you wish you were at top of your game, well, great, but you know what? You still got to get it done then. Um, another example, I wouldn't call it an emergency, but it's the kind of thing, say it's a Friday afternoon, you're winding down, maybe you're you know, you're maybe you're not too sluggish yet, but you're at alert but not creative. Your boss walks in your office and says, uh, and says, hey, Bella, uh, I've been meaning to tell you this since Tuesday, but by 5 o'clock today, we have to have an analysis of X. Sorry for the late notice, but I need you to get it done now. So if the deadline is 5 o'clock and it's 2 o'clock and you have three hours to get it done and you just had that pasta lunch and you burned out on a Friday afternoon, you know what? You do the best you can because business is business. But now what I would say from a deadline perspective and from a delegation perspective for those who are managers is a good lesson to be learned here is that the sooner that you can assign a task, regardless of it's a TAS or K level task, the sooner you can assign that, those tasks to the members of your team, the better. The reason being is, is because everyone's uh, car, um, Oh, it's funny, uh, circadian rhythms. I don't know why it is, but some, I was in a presentation six months ago and I said circadian rhythms and one of the people in the audience says, hey, Eric, don't you mean Kardashian rhythms? And I haven't been able to get that word out of my head in six months. That's why I keep pausing when I say circadian. Uh, but anyway, is, um, uh, is that if I, if I as the manager can can delegate things to my team as soon as as soon as possible. So say Bella that you worked for me, and uh, I knew of a, uh, I was given a task that by my manager that I had to delegate to you, and it's Tuesday. And let's say it's a top of your game task. It's create a presentation. If I give that to you on Tuesday and say its deadline is Friday, then you have three days using the same methodology to figure out when you want to write it so that you can do it to the highest possible quality in the shortest number of amount of time because you'll do it at top of your game. If I wait till Friday to give it to you and you're a beginning of the week kind of person, you're still going to you know, bang through it and get me something. But I, as the manager, are hurting my own team's productivity and quality by not letting you do it when based on your circadian rhythms and you know, top of your game and such. Great question. All right, and then we have a question about whether you monitor how many times a week, a week you would have all the different levels of energy. Uh, you know, f uh, the, the short answer to that is I don't do it in a formal way, but I sort of mentally do it. You know, like I, for me, it's more uh, because I have different kinds of days. Uh, if, uh, like, for example, yesterday I was at a CIO conference all day and did a, uh, uh, did, did a panel on a specific topic on talent management. Today I'm doing this webinar kind of thing. So but in, so there, for me in general, I'm much better in the morning than I am at the sort of the middle of the day, the two to three. But then I personally gain energy around 3.30 and will go to like six in the evening. On a given, you know, on a general day, that's me. So that what I'll do is that uh, I will take my activities and, uh, you know, and I'll pull them off the list at certain times. But what I'll also do is I'll plan my meetings based on where I think the level of energy both I need for the meeting or don't want to waste on the meeting. So, for example, is that uh, if I'm talking to an important client and I have to if, and I have the opportunity, I mean, if, this, if the client says to me, we're going to meet at three o'clock on Thursday, I have to say, OK, I can't say, well, you know, that's not a high energy time for me, you know, whatever it is. So, yes. But where I have the opportunity to pick the schedule, I do two things. One of which is, is I'll say, all right, how much energy do I need and need for this meeting? If it's a meeting that I really want to be on the top of my game, I'm pitching something to a new client, then I do it in the morning. Um, however, if it's a status meeting for my staff, what I'll do is I'll, yeah. I'll try to set it up maybe at the two o'clock, you know, two o'clock on a Friday when everybody's down a little bit. So I'm not destroying my team's productivity. 
Awesome. And then actually we have two different questions asking about collaboration. Um, one attendee is asking about working in open space settings and finding trouble getting that mental focus. Um, asking how does task fit in with the team approach to collaboration working and then we have another attendee who actually uses priority matrix in a team and was wondering how um, you know any tips on integrating the task methodology as a, uh, an entire team philosophy okay um, let me start with the second one so that I, I might ask you to re-ask the first no but problem from, from a team perspective there's actually a number of ways you can do it first of all is as the manager or as a team member is that there's huge advantage to common language what I mean by that is that if everyone learns that it starts using the t that you know the task methodology then what it allows me to do is a member of a team sitting in a room to say, um, you know, hey, everybody, you know, I'm really, I'm really top of my game right now. Any of you guys need anything done, you know, that meets that, you know, assuming that the people in the tasks are fungible, you know, that they can be moved from person to person. Or is that the other side of that coin would be is if it's a, if say I have a meeting at four o'clock and it's a Friday and I'm a morning person and Bella, you're an evening, per, uh, you know, more an end of the day person is I could say to you in the same language, hey, we have a really important call with the client. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really at an S rolling into K. I know that you're at a T and an A right about now. Any chance you can take the call for me? So it becomes a common language to do that. Also is, is that as tasks are assigned, you know, if you remember in the bottom right, it said unassigned is that if you know a task is gonna be difficult to perform when you're delegating or when you're sharing it in the team, is that what you can do is you put when you're you're adding it into the matrix put in you know that you think it's a T or whatever whatever level you think it is so that when other people they don't really have to evaluate it as much they can say oh I'm sluggish sorry right, what's Bella have on her list that I can grab and I'm sorry what was the first part of that question forgive me I missed it. yeah no problem the first was um, working in open space settings and having trouble with getting mental focus when there are so many distractions Okay. Or people stopping by the desk also. Okay. Couple, great question. Couple of things for that. First of all, is that I'll tell you what I did as, as a manager. Is there are some people who are great at multitasking, some that aren't, that can basically look up, talk to someone for a minute, and get back down. There are other people who can't do it. Uh, it's sort of a discussion for another day, but I have what I call the productivity zone. That when you're in the zone and you're in the middle of things, you don't want to be interrupted. What I would say is if you're the type of person who when interrupted, it's very hard to get back to what you're doing, find yourself, you know, a cube or an office kind of, if it's an office, you can shut the door. But if you're in the cubes, what I would suggest is uh, try to find yourself a place where they can't really find you unless they have a GPS. If it's in a common area where basically everybody, you know, true open space with people walking around then there's a couple of things you can do. What the best of which is, and this is something that works best if, if the whole department does it the same way, is have sort of talk to me, don't talk to me, little sign and get them for everybody. So, you know, if you really have to concentrate on something and you put up the sign or just someone comes by and you hold up the don't talk now, come by later, is that it's not that you're being mean to this person. It's just it's you're in the middle of something that you don't want to be interrupted. I've seen it done bothly. I've actually seen it done with with ping pong paddles, where they write like "stop and go" kind of thing, one on either side. Uh, I've seen it with like a little uh, a little uh, uh, paperweight that's made out of like a tile that says "talk to me now, don't talk to me." Um, what I've also seen is people using headphones. Do we have a time for me to give you a really funny two minute story on that? Yeah, we have a, a number of questions, but feel free. Okay. I think we can we can make is it. That, um, I, was, uh, I had someone working for me, and it was one of these open scope areas, open areas, and he had earphones in. So someone walked over to him and said, hey, Joe, Joe. And all of a sudden, you know, he started. I just happened to observe this because I was talking to someone facing his, his back. And uh, all of a sudden, some say, hey, Joe, Joe, can I talk to you for a minute? All of a sudden, he starts tapping his foot and sort of moving his sh shoulders like he's grooving to the tunes. Someone else walks over to him about 30 seconds, maybe a minute later, and says, hey, Joe. And he immediately takes out the earphone and says, yeah, what do you need? And I watched this. And then I, anyway, so uh, then when I saw him a little bit later, you know, just sort of talking to somebody, I didn't want to interrupt him. I said to him, I said, hey, Joe, I got a question I got to ask you. 
When the first guy walked over, you couldn't hear him at all. All of a sudden, he started grooving to the tunes when he's standing behind you. The second guy walked over, you immediately took out the earphone and started talking to him. What's up? And he said to me, he says, all right, I'll tell you, but I swear you to secrecy. I said, okay, well, his name was Joe and it was 10 years ago. So I don't think that I'm giving up, you know, any secrets. And uh, he said, you know what, I'm, you know what my earphones connected to in here? Take a look. He opened the draw and it wasn't connected to anything is that he used those earphones basically as a way to politely get people to leave. Thank you, Eric. I love that story. I do want to quickly just jump in and say that sure. we did host a webinar in the past talking about um, minimizing interrupt interruptions in large teams and priority matrix. So if anyone is interested in, um, you know, learning some more specific tips that we have that I think really go hand in hand with, you know, what you're saying here, Eric, just really prioritizing conversations and how to do that, um, you know, you, I would be more than happy to share that recording with you um, if you want to shoot me an email asking for that. Um, but let's keep on rolling. We have a couple more really great questions. Um, sure. So actually, one that just rolled in said, uh, getting more S and K examples really helped clarify. Can we get some more T and A examples? They just love your examples, Eric. <laughs> oh, sure. Is, is that, that that will be very much based on what your job is. So I'll give you an example of it from mine. Is that, as you know, I run a training company. I do keynote speaking, that kind of stuff. So specifically what would be the, the, the things that are creative is when I'm creating things that are intellectual property. So it could be the writing of a blog, the working on a, uh, working on a new book. It could be, for example, the, you know, with, with a blog itself is that I find that there's two types of creativity. There's the, crea there's the crea creativity that comes on thinking of what you're going to write about, the topics. So sometimes it could be at any time, you know, I'll just say, uh, I'll just get in, oh, I could write one on this, I'll write one on that. And all of a sudden I get in the groove of that and I come up with like two months worth of blog blog titles. But then there's a different type of creativity for me, and I would call that a T-task. I usually do that one opportunistically. Uh, but anyway, it could be writing, it could be uh, doing proposals, it could be uh, related to uh, writing a, a new keynote, um, anything that's creating intellectual property, the development of an e-learning class, uh, or also from a business development perspective, it could be if I'm writing my marketing plan or things along that line. But the things that A, create intellectual property for you, whatever that might be, or B, are those things that you, among other things, have to get right. Like I'll give you an example. As a manager, you know, one of the things that I know I always hated to do, and I have an accounting degree, uh, is do my annual budget. But if you've ever done a bad budget for your department, got it all approved, and then basically had to suffer with it for the next year because you didn't do a good job on it, uh, believe me, from that year forward, um, I always made sure that I was in, I didn't call it that then, but I always made sure that I was at the top of my game when I did my annual budget. I would also make sure that I was at the top of my game when I wrote people's performance reviews as a manager. The reason being is, is because, you know, as a manager writing a performance review and giving a performance review, you want to just check off the task that you did it. But for the person receiving the review, you know, it's a life event. So I'm always very, very careful to do that in that way. Um, let me see for alert, but not creative. Uh, that would be, uh, important emails that I need to send out to clients. I think I, oh, I think I mentioned that one before. Um, others are, is that if I'm uh, reviewing my financials, sort of assessing cash flow, uh, if I'm figuring out uh, what clients uh, I should try to work with based on prior work, you know, things along that line. So things that, you know, I'm not creating intellectual property, but I really need to be paying attention in order to do it correctly. Uh, if I'm, um, uh, you know, for example, if I'm, oh, another thing I would do then is reading a contract or writing a contract. Because quite frankly, is, is that not that I'm a lawyer, I don't even play one on TV, but, uh, but reading, you know, I have to read all the contracts coming in, you know, not for the legalese, if needed, I can pass that along. But basically, the pieces in it regarding the, I read it specifically on the intellectual property, the, develop, the delivery, you know, all of that kind of stuff, the marketing rights um, and, and things. I will read or write those or construct those during, um, during alert, but not creative. 
Awesome. And then we have another question. Which is the time period you usually use when planning your activities with Priority Matrix? Week, two weeks, full month. How far out do you go when planning? <clears throat> Um, what I do is I have what they call, you know, you know what for brains is that I, uh, if I don't write it down, as, if I don't write it down as soon as I hear it uh, or as soon as I think of it, it's gone. So I continually build my list, you know, build the lists into the matrix uh, as soon as it comes to mind. And then each day what I'll do is I'll look at them and figure out, you know, which ones are really the do nows. Uh, and so I, so it works for me both as a prioritization, but also as just a memory that I that I need to get it done. Uh, as far as for distance is a time out, you know, like if it's schedule, what I'd like to do is to say there's another concept. Actually, the concept is in the book, uh, but it's obviously not in in the the webinar I just did. The idea of near time and far time. Think of how pr protective you are of your schedule in the next week and a half. You know, you have to bring your kid to soccer. You have a doctor appointment. You have a presentation that's being done next Thursday. Your major project is about three days behind, and it's due next Friday, so you know you're going to be working the weekend kind of thing. You're not going to let anyone interrupt you. But then you look at your calendar, say, for first week of August. Oh, it looks wide open. All right. Why? Because you don't know what emergencies are going to come up, what, pr what projects are going to be behind schedule, et cetera. So as a result of that, you're much more freer letting people get on and schedule things and doing things with you in the far time than you are in the near time. So what I would say to you, as you're planning things out through the priority matrix or, or life in general, be as protective of far time as you are near time because you know the problem is eventually far time becomes near time and you'll look at the things that are on your calendar or the things that you've agreed to do and you'll say to yourself, wow, what was I thinking? Awesome. Actually, we have two questions regarding power naps. One person is suggesting them and one person is asking your opinion about them. Oh, uh, you know, that's one of those things that, you know, that I, I know people who swear by it. But, you know, is myself, it's never really worked for me. I would also say where it is and how you're being judged. The reason is, is that I'm, uh, I'm a baby boomer. I don't think that surprises anyone. And the way that we classically were measured in the workforce as you know as kids going you know growing up through our uh, through our business ranks uh, is how active are we as our, at our desk you know do we look like we're busy are we continually doing things or are we sitting back watching space invaders or you know asleep at our desk so that can be if, if that's what you mean by power nap in that situation that can be extremely hurtful to your reputation and your career uh, there are some people who truly believe that a power nap is awesome for them. You know, they'll set their alarm for 15 minutes. They'll close their eyes, their office door, or if they work at home, and it bring, wakes them up refreshed. I think that it's awesome. You know, the, the, the key is, is the investment in time in the power nap, that 15 minutes or whatever it is. Does that investment of 15 minutes, will you make that back in either quality or increased productivity because you're more awake? moving forward. Awesome. Um, now we actually have two, just two more questions and they're actually both about books. The first one is about your book. Um, the attendee is asking, sometimes when I go to book readings or book signings and I, I like to ask the author, you know, how to read the book. And sometimes the answer is just start from the beginning and continue. And sometimes the answer is, uh, there's like a sp specific methodology, actually start with this chapter. Do you have any thoughts? Well, my first thought is, is since my book is on productivity, don't wait for the movie. <laughs> <laughs> but, but on a serious note, what I'd say is what I like to do is I make friends with a book. When I get it is, is that I'll flip through the table of contents just to know what's there. And particularly a book like mine is, is that you won't use everything. No one, I don't use everything exactly the way it's written in the book. What I, you know, is that uh, because the circumstances don't come up. So what I would do is two things, one of which I would just look through the table of contents for those two or three things, maybe four things that really resonate with you. Maybe it's in delegation. Maybe it's on maintaining corporate knowledge. Maybe it's uh, some other time techniques like this one, et cetera. But, you know, pick a couple of them that you really like, read those short sections on it, and then try to implement them. And once you've internalized it and it works for you, a month later, take another look at it for a new one. 
The other thing you could do is basically situational to say, wow, I'm having a productivity type issue coming up and then basically looking through the book for something that you think that you think you can help with that, that uh, you think could help you with it. So I tend to use not only my book, but all business books in that way. Awesome. Thank you. And then actually the final um, question that we have is asking about that book that you referenced um, and asking what in particular uh, you liked about that. Um, oh, okay. Kind of <laughs> oh, oh, from Caldini. Um, actually, to be honest, I forget, I think his book is called, uh, I forget the name of his book because I mostly just go uh, refer people. I, I have it in my shelf somewhere. But what I'd like to say if you, if the, uh, uh, it's a YouTube. It runs for about just under 11 minutes. I think it's like 10 minutes, 50 seconds or something like that. And it's called The Art and Science of Persuasion. It's great. It talks about six different techniques on basically how to inv how to use influence uh, in, in a positive way, you know, in, obviously. But uh, what I would suggest is to take a look uh, to take a look for the YouTube. Now, be careful. Make sure it's the you know the the, the ten minute fifty second one or whatever it is, because a lot of people have taken snippets of what he's done so that they can call it something similar, so that people will go to their YouTube channels. I'm not obviously the way I'm saying it is I'm not in favor of that. But it will start out, the whole thing is basically a guy writing on a whiteboard, you know, with a marker. It's one of those type type videos. And it's awesome. called The Art and Science of Persuasion. Awesome. And then actually, if you, if you have a little bit more time, Eric, we have one final question coming in right now. Absolutely. Um, this person says that they're in IT, so they just had, you know, they were wondering whether you could um, just quickly say something about your method in relation to IT, uh, oh, if you had any yeah. thoughts. Oh, absolutely. That's really funny. I spent 30 years in IT. <laughs> so without a doubt is that the way that I would use this is that part of it would depend on your job. But I mean, I could see, for example, taking both my, uh, you know, the task, if I'll go back to that slide for a moment, like in here, is if uh, I would do this as a, uh, on a project basis, you're just looking back at the screen. Um, so for Project X is go there and build one of these for Project X uh, and for each of the different tasks you're performing. Uh, that could work as a, as a BA or a project manager. As an IT manager, the best way that I would suggest to do that, particularly if you're in the app dev side, where you have people developing software, writing documentation, doing test plans, you know, all that kind of stuff is not only figure out, you know, certainly who does what, but I would try to delegate them because they're knowledge workers. I would try to delegate to them as tasks as soon as possible so that they can do it when they're at their highest level. If I can just say one more thing, it's knowledge workers in general, in addition to IT, is that, uh, and you actually, this is something you'll see in the book. It's called manager time versus knowledge worker time. And the idea behind it is, is managers work in one hour time frames. You know, we'll have a meeting from nine to 10, 10 to 11. And one of the things we need to do as managers is we need to be able to, you know, at the click of a finger, move from topic one to topic two as we've gone from conference room one to conference room two. Unfortunately, programmers or people writing documentation or testers or whatever don't work in that way. Knowledge worker time is two to three hours. It goes through a four or five step process. Again, you'll, you can see more of this in the book, but basically you start by nesting. Think of it as if you're, a, you're whatever your IT role is. Help desk is a little different, but uh, you sit there and you say, all right, I'm going to write this new algorithm. Okay, uh, let me see. Here's the, here's the Google stuff I've looked up on. Here are the requirements from my boss. Here's this, here's that. That's called nesting. And then once you move past nesting, what you do is you go into engagement where you start working on it. And then from there, look at that as being alert, but not creative kind of level, so to speak. Uh, and then just naturally, just like we don't say, all right, I'm going to go to sleep. You close your eyes and poof, you're out. It's a natural process. So then you'll get into this zone of super productivity, which will run for an hour and a half, doing your algorithms, your test plans, whatever it is. And then you naturally fade off of it in the future, uh, you know, toward the end of it. But anyway, the reason I'm saying that is, is you're figuring out people's uh, when to have meetings with people or and whatnot is don't do it in the middle of their high productivity time. So as an IT manager, if you want to, if you have all morning people and you want to destroy your team's productivity, 
The way to do it is have a short staff meeting every day from 10.15 to 10.30, just enough to break them out of the zone and have them get back in. Nice. And I actually just want to jump in and say that um, we do, again, um, just bringing up other webinars now, we do have a webinar on reports that sort of covers um, the reports and the analytics and how you can actually understand what is the hot, most high priority uh, or high productivity time for your team. So if you are interested in that as well, please pop in, you know, just indicate that in the question box and I can send that webinar to you. All right, that's about all. Uh, thank you so much, Eric. This was so great and so um, you know, insightful and informational. I really appreciate you making the time. Oh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you so much. Is that I really appreciate it. Thanks for those who are stayed on longer and are still on the line. And uh, if you have any questions, you know how both Bella and I can be reached. Thank you. All right, again, yes, thank you everyone for attending. Um, and if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to either of us. Other than that, have a great rest of your day.